I'm so proud that London has today chosen hope over fear and unity over division. It was a major win, but not an easy campaign. London's new mayor, Sadiq Khan, was accused of being linked to Muslim extremists by his rivals. But he won the race against the odds. So is Sadiq Khan the new image of Britain's multicultural society? And will his victory set an example for the rest of Europe? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the programme. I'm Laura Kyle. Voters in London have made history by electing Sadiq Khan as their mayor. He's the first Muslim to be elected leader of a Western capital. Khan, the son of a Pakistani bus driver, won against his conservative rival Zach Goldsmith. It was a bruising and hard-fought campaign. Goldsmith and his party were criticised for linking Khan to Muslim extremists. But given Khan's margin of victory, which is the biggest in recent UK history, voters seem to have rejected the negative campaigning. Khan has now promised to be a mayor for all Londoners. My name is Sadiq Khan and I'm the mayor of London. <laughs> I'm determined to lead the most transparent, engaged and accessible administration London has ever seen. And to represent every single community and every single part of our city as mayor for all Londoners. Well, during his victory speech on Saturday, Sadiq Khan said he had great ambitions for the people of London. I'm deeply humbled by the hope and trust you have placed in me today. I grew up on a council estate just a few miles from here. Back then, I never dreamt that someone like me could be elected as mayor of London. And I want to say thank you to every single Londoner for making the impossible possible today. I have a burning ambition for London, an ambition that will guide me every day as mayor of our great city. I want every single Londoner to get the opportunities that our city gave to me and my family. The opportunities not just to survive, but to thrive, to fulfil their potential. Well, let's take a closer look at Sadiq Khan and his opponent, Zach Goldsmith. Khan is the son of Pakistani immigrants and one of eight children who grew up on a council estate. He previously worked as a human rights lawyer and was transport minister under Gordon Brown's Labour government in 2009. Zach Goldsmith is a Conservative Party member and a multi-millionaire who inherited most of his wealth from his father, who was a businessman. Goldsmith attended the elite Eton College, which has educated 19 British Prime Ministers. So, new leadership for Britain's capital. Let's bring in our guests to talk about this more now. They're all in London. Anita Vasisht, who's an immigration lawyer and who filed a complaint to police about the Conservative mayoral campaign. Talha Ahmed, spokesman for the Muslim Council of Britain, and Joe Twyman, the head of political research for Europe at YouGov. Great to have you all with us. First of all, I want to set the scene for any viewers who may not have followed this mayoral election, because it was a pretty bruising campaign that we saw with Conservatives going all out to attack Khan, often on the basis that he was Muslim. They were also accused of being divisive and of stereotyping Asian communities. And Anita, I know that you're well placed to talk about this because you experienced firsthand uh, some of Goldsmith's campaign tactics. Do tell us about them. That's right. So um, I received some campaign literature actually from the Prime Minister David Cameron written to me uh, and really appealing to me on the basis of my India Indian ethnicity. Uh, which was the first time that I'd ever seen this uh, happen before in, in, in Britain. What did, what, how did they try to appeal to your Indian ethnicity? And what was, what was upsetting you about that? Okay, so, um, so, so I received a letter uh, 
one day and I started reading it and it said dear Anita and then and then the first few paragraphs were were pretty standard uh, campaigning uh, stuff mm. and then suddenly uh, there was another section and it was all about uh, the British Indian community in the UK and uh, and the I think the the line that that most upset me probably immediately was when the Prime Minister wrote to me your community uh, uh, is extraordinary or, or, or something like that but it was it was that phrase your community and uh, and for me as someone born and raised in in Britain for me as someone born and raised in London my community is a British community and so 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 can you imagine the shock of my Prime Minister writing to me and and basically telling me that that he thinks that he and I belong to different communities. Mm. And the assumption perhaps then that being an Indian lady you thought the same as, as every other Indian in London. That's right, that, that's absolutely correct and, um, and, and also uh, what struck me was that that this was the first time we'd seen this in Britain, a uh, political party writing to us on the basis of our Indian ethnicity. And, and it has struck me as odd that the first time we, we see this, and, and, and you must remember that it's only Indians, uh, uh, only Hindu and Sikhs are mainly Indians who received the, uh, these letters and, uh, and and for me you know it, it really did strike me as odd and and I was concerned that the the first time we're seeing this is when we're also seeing a British Pakistani mayoral candidate. Mm. Tell her uh, the Goldsmith campaign maintains that it's done nothing wrong. It's faced an awful lot of criticism um, in the way it's handled this race. But it says that its tactics are just, quote, modern campaigning. Would you agree with that? Well, I think if it is modern campaigning, then we are at a very depressing modern period. No, I don't think it is a uh, mo you know, modern tactic, and nor should it be. Um, and Londoner has, Londoners has rightly rejected it. But don't forget that this comes on the back. It's overseen by the same group of people who mastermind the last mayoral election, last Tory election. And in the last general election, we have seen that Islamophobia uh, covertly, overtly were rife. And unfortunately, because previously it has worked, there was a presumption that it might work this time. And it hasn't worked. And I'm pleased that it hasn't worked. Why do you think Goldsmith and his party, because a lot of the Conservatives jumped on this bandwagon, why did they approach the race like this, Talha? Well, I think there may be a number of reasons. I mean, I mean, there is historic uh, sort of tension between Pakistani and Indian uh, communities previously. Mm. Um, the rise of Modi in India, and it appeals to a certain group of people. So there is a presumption, perhaps, by Tory government that it would appeal to a broader uh, community, you know, at the expense of the Muslim community. And there was, I suppose, a calculation that Muslim community historically doesn't probably support Tory as much. But I think where they've got it wrong, um, as the, you know, conservative, the chair of Conservative Muslim Forum puts in an article today, is that the Muslim support for conservative has been uh, going through an upward trajectory. And almost all conservatives, including himself, you know, the chair of a Conservative Muslim Forum, former chairman of Conservative Party, Baroness Warsi, the outgoing deputy uh, mayor, all of them thought that this was, you know, inappropriate, um, a missed opportunity, and in fact, it will do a lot of damage to, to the progresses made by Conservative Party to make headway into other communities. You know, you just so, you, yeah, it was a combination of trying to. Sorry, sorry for, for jumping in there because you just mentioned the Conservative Muslim Forum. I wanted to bring this point in later. I'll, I'll ask it to you now, seeing as you brought it up. It was silent during Goldsmith's campaign. It didn't speak out against. Uh, these divisive tactics. Yeah. It's Did that upset you? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think, you know, I understand why he did, and he explains, you know, why he did not. Although I understand, but I don't agree with it. Mm. Um, you know, Muslim Council of Britain doesn't take a partisan political stance, and so we haven't backed any candidate. And Zach Goldsmith, of all the Tories, actually had a rather good track record of reaching out to communities, especially local Muslim communities. So we were 
very sad and very disappointed to see that of all the people, Zach Goldsmith's campaign should re, you know, resort to such kind of thing. And the Tories, uh, the Muslim Tories and all Tories have a duty to make sure that when that kind of divisive politics you know, comes to the fore, they challenge it. Bernard Swarsi did so, you know, a few others did, and I'm disappointed that Conservative Muslim Forum chair and other leadership didn't. Mm. Joe, as Talha says, um, Zach Goldsmith, by all accounts, is a perfectly nice, likeable man. He's got great environmental credentials. He's liked as an MP in his constituency. So therefore, it seems to be all the more surprising that he took this tone. Is it just a case that he was badly advised? No, I, don't, I actually don't think it's surprising at all. The uh, context in which this takes place is that London as a whole is broadly supportive of Labour. And so mm. that means that any Conservative candidate who wishes to become mayor starts from a position of disadvantage. In order to win, they have to overperform compared to their parties. Now, Boris Johnson has been able to do that over the last two terms, but he's very much unusual in so many ways, but not least because he's a political outlier. He's able to get support from parties beyond simply those of the Conservatives. And actually, during his, uh, during his reign as mayor, was able to get over 50% approval ratings from supporters of all parties, which is practically unheard of in, uh, in Western democracies and certainly unheard of in Britain. So Zach Goldsmith started from behind, and he knew that the Labour campaign would attempt to paint the uh, contest as one between the son of a bus driver who then grew up to be a human rights lawyer compared to a millionaire playboy from old, uh, uh, who used to go to Eton mm. and has done precious little with his life. And this is a reaction to that because ultimately what it comes down to is the desire to win. Both sides wanted to win and they chose the tactics that they thought were the most appropriate to get the most votes. And given that they had to, given that uh, the Conservatives had to perform to people outside their usual group. That meant appealing to ethnic minorities who had traditionally voted, uh, uh, voted for Labour, not universally, but more, uh, more often than, uh, than the rest of the country. And so appealing to, appealing to them using targeted methods, which, as, uh, as David Cameron said, uh, were, is all part of modern campaigning. Modern campaigning means using targeted messages for both positive and negatives. Now you can argue about whether that, uh, whether that was right or wrong, but it is, it is technically, the, uh, technically the case. And uh, in this instance, it appears to have backfired. It has been criticised not just by Baroness Varsi, uh, a Conservative peer, but also by Lord Ashcroft, the, um, uh, who's not exactly famed for his support of David Cameron in recent months, but still an established, a member of the established uh, Conservative hierarchy. Uh, Anita, I can see there that you were shaking your head uh, at the suggestion that this was modern campaigning. Uh, Joe did say, of course, that it has backfired. Was it the best approach that Zach Goldsmith could have taken, the most appropriate approach? Um, f for me, I, I think that the campaign strategy used by Zach Goldsmith and his team was ugly and dangerous. I think it was the worst possible campaign strategy that they could have used in London. And I'm so glad and proud that London rejected it resoundingly. Uh, interesting, Tala, London rejected it. If this had been held at a national level, would the UK have rejected it uh, in quite such uh, force? Well, it's difficult to say, but we hope that it, it, it will. But one of the points I want to add to Peter's one is that uh, true, the Tory uh, candidate has to appeal to a wider group of people, but Zach Goldsmith was actually very well placed to cut into Labour support within the Muslim community. And he did have a lot of goodwill within mm. um, you know, uh, various sections within the Muslim community. So I am rather you know, surprised, disappointed, and also confused why he didn't recognize that opportunity and didn't actually take uh, that opportunity. A and also the bottom line is this, if it may be more than, t you know, I, I am all for targeted, focused campaigning, but at a time when Muslims find themselves under, you know, so much pressure from so many corners, some of it rightly, but often because bigoted, you know, hateful individuals targets Muslims simply because of being Muslim, the politicians has to show leadership. And unfortunately, on this occasion, we have not seen that. Will the country accept that kind of you know, um, approach in a national level? I hope it will not. I genuinely uh, hope it will not. Uh, Joe, it's a good point, isn't it? Why didn't Zach build on the relations he already had within the Muslim community and recognize it as an opportunity for a positive campaign? 
Well, I, I, look, I'm, I'm not passing judgment on whether mm. this was the right thing or the wrong thing to do. We can conclude simply by the fact that he lost, that it was not successful. Uh, I, my sense is that he chose this, he and his advisers, and some of whom were extremely well paid, of course, uh, the reason they took this particular course of action is that they believed at the time, based on the evidence they had available to them, that it would be the most successful chance they had of winning. And, and so that, that's the calculation they make. They make a strategic decision of all the possible options they could take, of all the p potential strategies they could, uh, they could employ. Which is the likely, which is the most likely to get the most votes, and that's the decision that they made. And you, or in such circumstances, you always weigh up the votes you will get in one area compared to the votes you will lose in others. And while uh, while Sadiq Khan chose successfully to paint this uh, uh, contest as a, as a battle between a bus driver, the son of a bus driver versus the son of a billionaire, Zach Goldsmith chose wrongly to present it as a contest largely between an extremist, and not just an extremist in terms of, uh, in terms of his religion and his ethnicity and his willingness to, to talk with extremists, but also an extremist in political terms, his willingness to work with Jeremy Corbyn, the Labour leader, who is unpopular in the country. So an extremist versus a conservative moderate. That's the, uh, that's the strategy that they, uh, that they approach. And as I say, I'm not making a judgment about whether it was right or wrong in strategic terms, simply it was wrong in the sense that it did not uh, did not deliver the victory he was hoping for. Yeah, I, I understand that. And, and I know you deal with polls, you know, with YouGov, and there was one poll last year that suggested a third of Londoners would be, quote, uncomfortable with a Muslim mayor. Do you think that was the sort of evidence that the campaign was basing its strategy on? Uh, and does that still hold true now, now that they've actually voted for a mayor? Exactly. Well, well, we'll uh, you you got similar figures in uh, in the United States with uh, with people when they were voting for Obama and the question about whether they'd be comfortable with a uh, with a black uh, black president. My sense is that uh, yes, a proportion of the country, uh, sorry, of the country, but also of the voting uh, voting public in London will be uncomfortable with uh, with a Muslim mayor. I imagine that uh, some of those are obviously not going to vote for Sadiq and were never going to vote for Sadiq mm. and probably would have voted for Zach regardless of who the Labour candidate would have been. And then in other cases, I imagine people would have to put it bluntly, got over it and thought to themselves, well, is this, uh, is this actually so important that it's going to affect my vote? And looking at, the, uh, looking at the data, it appears that actually people voted along political lines. And so the fact that uh, Sadiq Khan uh, was a Muslim is important, but it's not actually important to the voters. What was, a, what was most important to the voters is the fact that he was the Labour candidate. The fact that he was the Labour candidate was far more important than the fact that he was a Muslim. Uh, uh, yes, absolutely, and, and that's why I think that it's important to look perhaps in this discussion more at the campaign by the other side rather than Khan, because they made it into such an issue that he was Muslim. Talha, if we look uh, back at the national issue, do you think uh, there are a number of people within Muslim communities, maybe ethnic minorities, who might be turned off by the Conservatives' approach to this? Um, I think for a long time, uh, most people within the Muslim community who aspire to become politicians or go into public life um, fear that if they do go, uh, they will face a very tough time. And so that puts many people off. But I think what Sadiq Khan's victory will do, and incidentally, by the way, Sadiq Khan was our colleague in Muslim Council of Britain some years ago. Mm. It will, uh, in the long run, inspire many, many young people to... Uh, to, to move into public life, and I hope it, do, it, it, it has a huge impact. But I think one of the points I also wanted to add is that the reality of Sadiq Khan is Sadiq Khan in many ways represents the modern face of London. Mm -hmm. You know, people on mid to low, earner, low earning uh, bracket, if you like, people who are struggling to make you know, ends meet. And on the, on the other hand, you have another thriving elite uh, class within, in London whose wealth just goes bigger and bigger and bigger. And I think on these occasions, Londoners, especially I think from mid to you know, low earning Londoners, thought that a, a, a person who gone through that journey, a person who has seen what it is like to live in a council estate, to come from a relatively underprivileged background, you know, how it feels to live in that city and make good out of it, and so I think that has inspired uh, people to vote for him, and people clearly thought that he could deliver on it. A and I think it will inspire Muslims, many Muslims, many you know, ethnic minority um, people from ethnic minority communities to feel that 
to believe that if you put your hard work in, if you are committed, if you have what it takes to succeed in public life, you can make it. Your race, your religion will not ultimately matter if you can cut through it. And that's a great message for Britain to be sending out. Anita, if we look more broadly, if we extend this a little bit to Europe and uh, look at potential significance internationally, I don't want to sort of put more onto this than, than should be done, but capitals in Europe are, are being targeted by ISIL attacks. There's rising backlash against huge numbers of refugees, many of them Muslim. Do you think that Khan's win is sort of bucking the trends that we are seeing throughout the rest of Europe? Absolutely. I feel that what we're seeing in London is unity in diversity and I'm aware that lots of uh, countries in Europe, all European countries, uh, are watching very closely what's happened in London and I, and I sincerely hope that what they take away from uh, our experience here is that, um, that we say yes to hope and no to fear. OK, so you think that uh, it, it combats, perhaps, a, a rise in Islamophobia that we might well be seeing in, uh, in other countries around Europe? I think, that, uh, I think that it sends out the message of inclusion, and I think that message is so extremely important. And uh, as the voice of fear grows louder, I feel that the voice of hope needs to grow even louder than that. And I think that that's, that's what the election of Sadiq Khan has, has done here. OK. Uh, Tala, how much do you think of, of Khan's mayorship? Will we be talking about him being Muslim and, uh, before other more pressing issues come to the forefront? Well, no, I, I think his uh, religious identity will come um, you know, repeatedly. We have seen with many high-profile Muslims in public life that a section in, media, in, in the media are fascinated by their religious identity and always finds rather creative ways of linking them to all sorts of things. So I think Khan's religious identity is not going to go away. But uh, you know, overall, I think ultimately the bread and butter issues of London will, um, you know, will, will, will dominate the discussion about uh, Sadiq Khan and, and his performance uh, at, at the City Hall. Uh, but one of the points I, I, I also want to say is that while Sadiq Khan's you know, victory is exciting and certainly makes, should make London a proud, the reality is that in terms of political representation, representation of ethnic minority and Muslims in public life, it remains as poor as it, uh, as it has been. And so let's use Sadiq Khan's victory as an opportunity, as a beginning, as an inspiration to build a better, fairer society which broadly reflects the diversity of, mm. you know, the diversity of our population. And that work must carry on uh, if, if with uh, more rigor and more force. Joe, in that spirit of sort of greater unity, do you think we're going to be able to see Khan working with the Conservatives during his mayorship after such a bruising campaign? Uh, well, I think the immediate uh, area in which they will work together and they'll have to work together is regarding the EU referendum. Mm. Britain uh, is having a vote at the end of next month to decide whether we will stay a member of the European Union or not. And I imagine that the campaign to stay in Europe will be delighted uh, that Sadiq Khan has become mayor because having a Labour supporting uh, uh, individual who in turn supports passionately and has campaigned for staying in Europe and is in a, now this high profile, if not necessarily high powered position in Britain, coupled with a Conservative uh, Prime Minister in David Cameron, that's a very powerful combination to, uh, to go to the public with uh, that appeals across party lines. And, uh, and I think they will be delighted that, uh, that the two will, uh, will be, I'm sure, uh, keen to work together, if only to keep Britain, uh, to keep Britain in part of, uh, is part of Europe. And that would have not been the case had Zach Goldsmith, who is famously anti-European, been selected. So a very different period ahead for London, very different indeed to Boris Johnson's uh, term as mayor at least. Thanks very much for all of our guests for joining us here today. Anita Basish. Tala Ahmed and Joe Twyman. And thank you too very much for watching. You can see the programme again anytime by visiting our website, that's aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, do go to our Facebook page, that's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Laura Kyle, and the whole team here. Bye for now.